this one's going to be this, this shop talk is going to be a little shorter than normal. Um, I'm traveling. I'm recording this in my hotel room in Tokyo right now. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of touch on something that came up for me recently that made me think about a few things, and that's around iconology and symbolism. Now, iconology and symbolism, uh, they're actually different things. Um, an icon, right, by itself, an icon is a pictorial representation of the thing that it's representing, a thing or a process that it represents. It's a picture of the thing, basically a simple one. Whereas a symbol, a symbol doesn't necessarily look like the thing it's representing. And if you think of symbols like a cross or um, <clears throat> a crescent or something like that, uh, those symbols don't necessarily represent the things that they, that they are. Um, they stand for that, and when you see those, you know what it's talking about. But an icon, when you see an icon, you know that it represents what it's doing, the, the either the process or the thing. If you see an icon in a game that shows two dice, you're probably going to roll two dice, or there's going to be dice rolling in it. And what made me start thinking about this uh, is here in Tokyo, you know, you look around and you can, even if you don't speak any Japanese or you can't read kanji, um, you can still find your way around. You can still find the toilets, for instance, because of the icons, uh, the standard set of icons. And we're presented with these kind of things in our everyday lives all the time. When you're thinking about using icons in games, near board game design, think about how it's used in your everyday life. For example, um, street signs, right? These street signs. If you look at those, even in silhouette, or even if you just see the street sign and you don't read it, you know what it is. You know the inverted triangle is a yield or a give way sign. You know the octagon means stop. The rectangular signs are going to have speed limit or rules information on it. Um, the round ones are caution or advisory signs. And even if you, you know, you just drive around in any country, you'll know what those signs mean. And that's kind of interesting. It's kind of cool because uh, it helps this universal understanding. Um, using them in everyday life, uh, like toilets, these two, for example, toilets are pretty universal. And these two symbols have been around for quite some time, and most people don't get lost when they see these. Uh, in Japan here, they go so far as to make the male one blue and the uh, female one pink um, to make it even easier to identify, especially from a distance, which is kind of good. Um, another set of symbols that is used frequently, well, somewhat frequently, but used a lot, is the symbols for the Olympic sports. Now, the icons represent the sport. The Olympic rings are a symbol that represent the Olympics and what it stands for. But all of these icons for the individual sports represent that sport. You can tell by the picture what it represents. Um, some of them have been stylized. Like if you look at the Sydney Olympics here, uh, they all have a boomerang in them. Right, So th there's always that stylization that you can do to make your icons fit the theme of your game. But don't go too far with it. If you go too far, it's going to lose its meaning. Now, Ikea is another one you can think of uh, or that has come up. But the, the things in the Ikea instruction manual are designed to convey the instructions in the process without relying on language. It's all pictures. But those are pictographs. Those are closer to hieroglyphs. Um, hieroglyphs were pictures that represented a process or represented someone doing something or something doing something. But hieroglyphs combined pictographs and icons. It makes it kind of an interesting thing to study, I think. But one of the things uh, that you use icons for, and primarily that you're going to use icons for, is to reduce the reliance on text. Um, because the more text you have in your game, 
if you create your game in English and you want to go to the German market, well, every piece of text you have has to be translated. Um, if you can, if you have customized dice and you put text on the dice, well, now you need new molds in a different language. And that's never a good thing. That's, that's a very expensive problem to have. But if you can use icons on those dice, then you don't have to change it. You can use the same mold and you can ship those dice to whatever country you want to and not have to worry about changing them. Uh, there's some games that have used iconology very well. Um, one of the games that, that even got like a patent on one of their icons is Magic the Gathering. Um, wizards actually you know, lock down that tap symbol with the arrow going 90 degrees to show you, you tap a card. Um, and the mana symbols. Those are very common and well understood icons in, in the system now. If you look at one of these magic cards, you can see that it's there, right? You can see the mana symbols, you can see the tap symbol, but one of the things they didn't do or haven't gotten to is the idea of the text and the text block. Now, in this one, it's, you, know, you can see some of the text down there. It's got like flying, but there isn't an icon for flying, even though flying has been in the game since the very beginning. And pretty much everybody who plays Magic, uh, they know what flying is. And if you had a symbol like some wings there, an icon for flying, people would understand that. But Magic even goes so far as to say flying and then say um, cre the creature can't be blocked except by creatures with flying or reach. Reach? So what if a creature has reach? It says, reach, this creature can block creatures with flying. Okay, which is kind of unique to magic because they not only say the word, but then they explain what they mean on the card uh, instead of just looking it up in a manual or a rule book or something like that, which is interesting but takes a lot of text. That makes translating magic cards uh, a, a big endeavor. Um, other games that have uh, been touted for their iconology or icon, icon, yeah, iconology, iconography, is Race for the Galaxy. This one's often brought up, and you can see that that the symbols on here are fairly clear. And even if you haven't read the rules or haven't delved into Race for the Galaxy, you kind of know what some of these symbols mean. You know, rolling, moving stuff. Um, Terra Mystica is another one that comes up a lot. This is the example of Terra Mystica here. Um, you can see that it's full symbols. Um, well, as many as they needed anyway. Um, Seven Wonders is another one that you could study that has very good iconography in it. Um, I personally think that a lot of uh, Stonemaier games, uh, the ones Jamie Stegmaier designed, Viticulture and Scythe and Euphoria, they've got very good iconography as well. One of the things about icons, though, is if they're too complex or too detailed, they get lost. You need to think about how your icons will be used and the easiest way to get them to be recognized. Because if they're too complex, people spend so long staring at the icon trying to figure out what it was. So they need to be easily differentiatable from the other icons in the game. Ideally, your icons should be able to survive if they're printed in one color, even black, even if it's just a silhouette. You've got a pretty good icon if you can do that. Um, you don't want to have too many. Um, now, there's always exceptions to the rule. Like, for example, one of my favorite uh, games that uses icons for custom dice is Marvel Dice Masters. Um, Th this thing has got all kinds of dice in it, and all those dice have different symbols on them, different or different icons on them, depending on who they represent or what they represent, or you know the, the either the the masks or uh, the colors and the style of the dice themselves are a symbol of who they're representing and the kind of the, the forces they represent. But the icons on the dice, pretty easy to figure out, right? So that, that's one way to look at that. Um, and you'll see this on cards, you know, Dominion, uh, it's got, you know, symbols and icons on it, uh, but it's one of those ways that you can really convey a lot of meaning or get someone to understand something very quickly 
with just a quick and easy symbol, easy symbol to remember. There are times when you need to be careful, though. Um, on one of the interview episodes, I interviewed Shannon Kelly, and we talked about his game, Lucidity. And in Lucidity, it's all about drawing dice and, and creating these nightmares and dreams and things. And he put icons on the dice. But because the, the game involves drawing dice out of a bag, the icons themselves couldn't be extremely distinct from one another because then you'd be able to feel them on the dice. And so you knew what you were going to draw uh, out of the bag. And I think that's an interesting problem to have when you think about icons and using them on dice. Uh, cards don't really have that problem, right? The board really won't have that problem. But when it comes to using dice, like in Lucidity, that's something you'll need to consider. Um, and, you know, we've been using icons in games since the very beginning. Uh, you take a standard deck of poker cards, diamond, spades, hearts, and clubs. You know what the suits are. They represent the suits, and that's pretty easy to figure out. So try to keep your icons simple. Um, I think when we were talking about the Olympic icons, that was one of the, the best descriptions I've heard of what icons are supposed to do. Um, and it was an article in Wired Magazine that I'll put a link down below to. But they said that the first job of an Olympic pictogram is to communicate what's happening. A bad icon assumes you know what you're looking at. Uh, a good one provides enough visual hand-holding to ensure that the message is clear. Um, the goal is for it to be immediately recognizable. And that's really the crux of it. That's the crux of a good icon is, if we look at these Olympic ones again, the goal is for those to be immediately recognizable. And that's what you want in your games too. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have people staring at icons and wasting a lot of time. And um, you want them to be able to glance at it, know what that's for, know what they're going to do. Uh, so think about that. Um, hopefully this kind of makes you think about it. And it just came, you know, kind of caught my attention as I was wandering around Tokyo here uh, that even though I couldn't read the language, um, I could tell where things were, what things were, uh, train stations, toilets, and things. And it made me think about the iconography in games. Uh, so hopefully you found this one interesting. It was a bit of a short one. We'll give you a little bit of a break. Uh, but as usual, if you have something you want me to cover, um, catch me on Twitter or something. It's at Cravon Studios with an O. Or put a comment down below. Um, and hopefully we'll see you in the future. <laughs> Have a good time and thanks for stopping by. One other thing, two really good sources of looking for icons for your games, thenounproject.com, thenounproject.com is really great for getting a lot of icons, and gameicons.net. Um, look those up, you'll you'll have a lot of success there. I don't know, maybe maybe we should come up with a standard set of icons for board games standardized on something like the Olympic icons with a bit of theming. What do you think about that? Well, let me know in the comments below. All right. Next week, we'll have another interview episode on the podcast, and I'll see you in two weeks with another Shop Talk. Bye, everyone. Bye.